Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 159, Let's Trade with Iceland. There's definitely an exclamation point at the end there. Let's trade with Iceland. Basically, Iceland is my favorite place on the planet. I've been going there for a decade now, and it's basically the perfect place for an introvert who loves being alone in nature, books, and baths. There's no better place if you like those three things. But I was interested in how our Tudor friends would have interacted with Iceland if they even would have. Obviously, there was trade with Iceland during the period when the Danes were living in England some six or 700 years before. But what about during our period? Well, as I started to dig into it, I found some really interesting connections with Iceland during the 15th and 16th century and some changing relationships that had to do with, as everything else seems to have to do with in this century, the Reformation. But let's go back a bit. The whole thing starts with fish. And I read recently that DNA testing on the bones of food found on the Mary Rose showed that some of the fish on the ship came from the North Sea and in waters just off the south coast of Iceland, showing that there was an element of globalization going on in Tudor England that we don't often think about. We know that Henry VIII expanded the English Navy. I did a few episodes on the Tudor Navy, including an interview with Benjamin Redding, a Tudor naval expert, back in 2016. And the growth of the Navy was supported by large stores of salted fish, namely cod. The growth in the fishing trade really made possible the growth of the English Navy. And then, of course, the Navy also helped to grow the fishing trade. So it was one of those sort of symbiotic circle relationships where each part helps the other. Also, cod was an excellent food for urban populations. People couldn't have cows in their backyard, but they could easily store a lot of salted fish. So Icelandic cod also made possible the growth of cities. Europeans south of Scandinavia started learning about Iceland around the 13th century. Even before that, supposedly King Arthur went to Iceland in the 6th century, but King Arthur did a lot of stuff that doesn't seem very likely, including taking swords from ferries and lakes, which, as Monty Python reminds us, is really no basis for a system of government. So we'll put that story aside. Of course, the Scandinavians had known about Iceland for centuries. The sagas talk about settlements in the 10th century. There was all the stuff about Eric the Red and Leif Erikson and his sister and everything like that. But by the 13th century, knowledge of Iceland had trickled down to the Mediterranean. Iceland was attractive to Southern Europe because it was a source of goods and natural products that they either didn't have at all or they didn't have enough of. So the fishing grounds were really rich and they provided an easy natural resource for fish, which was incredibly important during the Catholic period when there were so many fish days. So remember, three days a week and Lent and all of that kind of stuff, people were eating fish and they had a hard time keeping up with the demand. Iceland also offered other export goods. There was a special kind of wool. They had animal skins and fleeces and even sulfur. So this was kind of the basis of this trade between Iceland, the English, the Hanseatic League, the Dutch, the Norwegians, and then even down to Portugal and Spain. And there was even some luxury items that Europe wanted. There was walrus ivory and falcons. In 1531, the Swedish cartographer Olaus Magnus created a map of Iceland, one of the earliest that we have which highlights the important economic areas of the island, also showing natural dangers like volcanoes and also areas that are rich in sulfur along the southwest coast. It also shows tents storing fish along the south coast where modern-day Vik would be. The southwest coast of Iceland, particularly the peninsula around where Keflavik Airport is now, is dotted with these medieval trading villages. And archaeologists have found pottery that is continental, showing that the early traders had been on the scene by the end of the 14th century. And English pottery was actually even found in the north at Gassir, 
1402, the plague even arrived in Iceland via a ship. The English ship started coming around 1412 and began what some Icelandic historians call the English period. The Iceland merchants traded in dried fish. This was called stockfish. And stockfish was dried, whole, and headless. But because Iceland didn't have any coinage system, the merchants had to figure out other ways of negotiating prices and negotiating trades. So Iceland wanted things like ground corn and beer and clothing and products that were manufactured already, things like knives and kettles and scissors, and even some religious items and luxury items. In 1420, the merchants came up with an exchange rate that set the rate for goods brought from England in terms of the amount of dried fish that they would get in return. Additionally, some of the trading ships were also fishing trips. They weren't just one or the other. So the merchants on board would do some trading while the fishermen would fish. And then the ship would come back to England with both the traded stockfish as well as fresh salted fish caught in the waters off of the coast. In 1430, one of the earliest ships called the Christopher came back to the port in Hull with 5,400 salted fish, 60 stockfish, fish oil, and a specific type of woven cloth that Iceland traded in called Vadmal. There was a new technology to salting fish that became popular in the 15th century, and this allowed fresh fish to be salted on board. So while you were on board, you would gut the fish and pack them in salt in layers in sealed barrels while still on board. And this allowed the ships to stay away from shore for a longer amount of time and to stay in the fishing grounds, getting more fish before they returned home. By 1482, this type of fishing was actually mentioned in law books. And for example, in the 1540s, a ship called the James sailed from Dunwich and it had on board heading knives, gutting knives, and splitting knives for processing the fish on board. So it kind of reminds me of like an episode of The Deadliest Catch or something like that, this, the Tudor Deadliest Catch. The fishing boats became more productive and they would come on shore just for fresh water and shelter during storms and also to renew any supplies of fuel. These medieval temporary villages sprang up along the south coast in use probably for about six months out of the year. The English visitors described the the turf-walled houses as caves. In England, merchants and fishermen would form these partnerships to fund English ships to go to Iceland. For example, on the aforementioned James ship in 1545, one of the crew was a merchant called Geoffrey Smith. And he brought along finished goods that he wanted to trade while he was in Iceland. What probably happened was that the fishing vessel would drop off the merchants at a port and the merchants would stay there working and exchanging their goods before the ship came back to retrieve them and take them home. Ships like the James carried about 30 people or so and the return trip would take about six months. Usually they would leave in the spring and come back in the autumn. There are place names that are associated with the English. So, for example, in Iceland, you see names like Engladingabudir on Sigfjordur on the north coast of Iceland. That seems like a promising English name, English trading site. Also, there's a place called Engelskalag or English Hollow near Grindavik. And that is close to a possible 16th century harbor at Storabolt. And supposedly that is a place where the English were attacked by the German Hanseatic merchants in June of 1532. It's also close to where they think there was the site of several booths belonging to merchants from King's Lynn. In fact, there were a number of skirmishes in the early 1530s between the English and the Germans in Iceland. Hansdok is a database of primary sources pertaining to the trade of the North German Hanseatic towns within the North Atlantic islands, places like Iceland, Shetland, and the Faroe Islands, in the 15th to 17th centuries. And when you go through the database, you see a number of incidents between the English and the Germans. So, for example, in 1528, there was an incident where the English and Germans fought And the Hanseatic merchants wrote a letter to Henry VIII complaining about it. 
Then in 1532, some Germans complained that the English took fish that the Germans had already bought, and they were asking for permission to use violence against the English in order to make the English pay. Then in 1532, we have a, quote, lengthy complaint of Hamburg merchants against the English in Iceland who misbehave both towards German merchants and the Icelanders, are involved in fishing activities, rob the merchants of their ships and goods, and have attacked them on multiple occasions between 1486 and 1532. It seemed like there were some ongoing feuds. That same year, we have an account from the English. Johann Brown, William Kenneth, and Johann Sauermeer, merchants in King's Lynn, to Henry VIII of England, complain about the attacks of Ludke Schmidt and his crew on English merchants in the harbor Botsund in Iceland, whereby two English died and request to capture four Hamburg ships in the Thames so that the damage can be compensated and the perpetrators punished. So there was clearly some difficulty going on between the English and Germans in Iceland. There were also some questions about whether the trade was even allowed. Edward IV had an argument in 1475 with King Christian I of Denmark and Norway. Denmark and Norway, of course, annexed Iceland, and he prohibited trade with Iceland. And he said that English ships either needed a license to trade or they needed to go through the port of Bergen in Norway to trade or to pay customs dues and taxes on anything they bought or sold in Iceland. Some East Coast merchants did get licenses. There are records of their visits to Bergen to pay the taxes. But the rules weren't followed universally, especially for people on the West Coast. That would have made their trip thousands of miles longer through the North Sea to go to Bergen to pay their taxes. That would just be silly, right? So the workaround that they found was to go through Galway on Ireland's west coast. So Galway became a sort of kind of stopping off point for wine from Spain, salt and wine from Portugal. Then the merchants from Bristol would buy this wine and salt with English wool. Then they would go to Iceland, where they would trade the Spanish and Portuguese wine for stockfish and salted fish. Then the English ships would also carry materials to build barrels to bring back any fish that they caught. Then they'd go back to Galway and trade for more wine to take back to England so they could completely go around Bergen. One interesting aspect of the Icelandic fish trade was that during the Reformation, of course, the fasting days were reduced. And so the meals featuring fish began to re be reduced, obviously, as well. So this threatened both the trade with Iceland as well as England's own fisheries. So Elizabeth I brought back weekly fish days to encourage domestic consumption of fish. But perhaps the most interesting thing about Iceland and England during the early Tudor period is that Henry VIII was offered to buy Iceland three times. So there's a paper that Hannes Holmstein Gesaursen writes called Proposals to Sell, Annex, or Evacuate Iceland, 1518 to 1868. And in that, he writes, when Henry VIII ascended to the English throne in 1509, the presence of his subjects in Icelandic waters was by no means insignificant. Records show that in one year alone, 1528, a total of 440 fishing vessels were registered in England, of which 149 sailed to Iceland. One of the king's first acts was to abolish a statute from 1429, which had almost always been disregarded anyway, requiring all English subjects wishing to buy stockfish to do so only in Bergen in Norway. The Danish king, Christian II by that point, watched the English presence in Icelandic waters with some concern, but he also saw an opportunity. In 1518, he sent an envoy to Henry VIII, secretly asking for a loan of 100,000 florins, and he pledged Iceland as collateral. The envoy was instructed to go as far down, if necessary, as 50,000 florins. Nothing came out of this. Today, 50,000 florins would be the equivalent of about 6.5 million U.S. dollars. Then in 1523, Christian II was forced to abdicate and leave Denmark. Shortly before he left, he appointed Tyl Peterson from Flensburg as governor of Iceland and the Faroe Islands. Having previously served in Iceland as deputy governor in 1517 to 21, Peterson was unpopular with the Icelanders. Seen as an agent of the deposed Danish king and possibly with a mission to bring Iceland under the English king, 
the Icelanders executed him in the autumn of 1523. When Henry VIII heard of this, he angrily told Christian's emissary that as a consequence, he was not interested in acquiring Iceland and not even accepting it as a collateral for a loan. Christian II tried once again in 1524 to get a loan from Henry VIII, again pledging Iceland as collateral, but without success. And then in 1535, Christian III sent an envoy to Henry VIII, offering to pawn Iceland again for a loan. But again, Henry was not interested. He had some other marital issues going on by that point. So 1535 wasn't a good year to approach Henry VIII for a loan. Thus, in the span of only 18 years, Iceland had thrice been offered to Henry VIII by the Danish kings and thrice been rejected by him. Again, that is from this paper called um, Proposals to Sell Annex or Evacuate Iceland 1518 to 1868. I'll have a link to it in the show notes, which will be englandcast.com slash Iceland. And actually, that brings me to the end. So that's it for this week. And I don't have a specific book recommendation, but there are a ton of papers and blog articles and sources I used, which are all in the show notes, englandcast.com slash Iceland. Special shout out goes to the paper that Mark Gardner and Natasha Mailer wrote called Trading and Fishing Sites in Medieval Iceland. And also that aforementioned paper, Proposals to Sell Annex or Evacuate Iceland. Plus, My dear friend Mike, an American I met while living in London 20 years ago, who now lives in Iceland and helped me with a little bit of the pronunciation. I owe you a beer the next time I'm there, Mike. Let me know what you thought about this episode. You can get in touch with me at the listener support line 8016 Tesco or join the new Tudor Learning Circle, which is a free social network just for Tudor history nerds. Thank you so much for listening. It's 2021, guys. We're done with 2020. Hooray! And I will talk to you again in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> bye bye. Blow, northern wind, ascend, who may be sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoch auf Bord in Baurabrik, that soul is Sam Lee's on seat. Men school maiden of me, fair and fray to pond. In all this world, we shall won a bird of blood and a bond. Never yet in Ulster known, not so merry in London. Oh.